I do a lot of recipes here on Tasting History that are, to say the least, vague. Add enough nutmeg. Make a crust. Salt to taste. One of my Patreon patrons was even telling me that he found an old Jewish recipe that measured things in the Yartzeit candles, which are little candles used to commemorate the anniversary of a death. But I guess they're a fairly standard size. Anyway, these things can be fun to decipher. Obviously, I've created an entire show around it, but we wouldn't expect that in a modern cookbook. But in 1896, Fanny Farmer set out to change all that. And today, we are making her recipe for angel cake. So thank you to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video as we celebrate the well-written recipes of Fanny Farmer, this time on Tasting History. So I chose today's dish based on a request from my friend Shelly, whose birthday it is this month, and she loves angel food cake. So this is for you. Happy birthday, Shelly. Now this recipe is for angel cake, also known as angel food cake, and it's thought to be called so because if an angel ate it, it is so light that they could still fly up to heaven. And really, the recipe hasn't changed all that much since the 1890s, so let's see if Miss Farmer's recipe lives up to the reputation. So first, she gives us nice specific ingredient amounts, which we will discuss later. But then she gives instructions that say, beat whites of eggs until frothy, add cream of tartar, and continue beating until eggs are stiff. Then add sugar gradually. Fold in flour mixed with salt and sifted four times, and add vanilla. Bake 45 to 50 minutes in an unbuttered angel cake pan. After cake is risen and begins to brown, cover with a buttered paper. In the words of Dr. Evil, pretty standard, really. And for the ingredients, she calls for whites, eight eggs. Interestingly, in a later edition, she changes this to read one cup of egg whites, which is actually a better way of measuring them. And it's usually thought that eggs back in the 19th century were quite a bit smaller than modern eggs, so I decided to do eight egg whites and see how much that turned out to be, and eight large egg whites was exactly one cup. So who knows what kind of egg she was using? There were a lot more varieties than there are today. In the grocer's handbook and directory from about the same time, it tells about all of the different chicken egg varieties that were available in Philadelphia. Black Spanish, Houdons, La Flèche, and Creve Coeur, Leghorns, Cochins, Brahmins, Polins, Dorkins, Games, Sultans, and Hamburgs. Then it says that each chicken produces wildly different eggs, which is a good thing then that she switched over to volume. And I wish that actually more recipes today did that, because very few do, or even better, went by weight. That would be, that would be best. One teaspoon cream of tartar, one cup or 200 grams of sugar, superfine sugar is what you want. 3 fourths cup or 85 grams of flour, cake flour works best for this, a quarter teaspoon of salt, and 3 fourths teaspoon of vanilla. Now with any cake, but especially a light one like this, one might want a cup of coffee. And so I will have a cup of coffee courtesy of our sponsor, Trade. I've been loving my deliveries from Trade lately because I'm getting to know a lot of local roasters that would never actually make it into the grocery stores, so I'm getting exposed to a lot more coffee. All you have to do is take a simple quiz to let Trade know your tastes, and then they curate selections for you. Those are shipped to your door at peak freshness. Then you can customize your order frequency as well as how you like it ground and how you drink your coffee. Cold brew, French press, drip, etc. Then you can rate the coffees as well as curate your own delivery. And if you don't like that first coffee, they will send you a different one for free. Today, I am drinking Aroma Del Val from Sterling Coffee Roasters in Portland. The beans are from Peru, and they have hints of pistachio and honey. It's perfect because I do tend to like sweeter things, and this coffee has those notes. I also get some wonderful chocolate from it, which you can't go wrong with that. And viewers of Tasting History will get their first bag free, including free shipping. Just click the link in the description and take your quiz to get started. Now, before I have another cup, I think I should probably bake this cake. So first, preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 175 Celsius, and sift your flour and salt into a bowl. She calls for it to be done four times, which is exactly what I did. Then beat your egg whites on low until foamy, and then add in the cream of tartar and beat them until you get peaks. Now she says to beat them until they're stiff, but that's kind of subjective. Uh, you don't want them too, too stiff at this point because when you add the sugar in, then things go awry. So kind of go on the lighter side of stiff, just make sure that they kind of hold up on their own. One reason angel food cake became so popular at this time was because of whisking these eggs. Before the 1870s, it would have taken you like 30 or 40 minutes to get those stiff peaks. But in 1870, Turner Williams invented the two-whisk hand-cranked egg beater. 
and boy am I sure glad that he did. Granted, now I use an electric one, but even so, it was a step in the right direction. Also, it was a great way to use up egg whites that were left over after all of the egg yolks used to make the wonderful custards that were really popular at the time. And if you are looking to use up your yolks, I have a wonderful recipe up here for a medieval egg custard tart that is a divine. Now, once your peaks are achieved, start beating in the sugar a little at a time. Then once it's all incorporated, you can begin folding in the flour. Now, the only leavener in this cake is the air trapped in the flour and the egg white. So you want to be super, super gentle so you're not knocking out all the air. Otherwise, you get a flat cake. But this is also why the cake was so popular with the temperance movement. It was because it didn't have yeast, which they associated with beer. Evans to Betsy. Now, one thing that is different about Ms. Farmer's recipe from a modern recipe is when she adds the vanilla. Usually it would have already been done. She adds it at the very, very end, again, folding it in. So be very, very gentle with it. Then take your angel food cake pan and gently spoon in the batter. As she says, make sure it's not buttered or has any kind of spray because the batter needs to be able to kind of creep up the sides of the pan during the rise. And if you put anything slick on there, it'll just slump down. Then set it in the oven on one of the lower racks for 45 to 50 minutes. And while you wait for it to bake, let me tell you just why this lady was so darn influential. Fanny Merritt Farmer was born in Boston in 1857, but at the age of 16, she suffered a paralytic stroke which took her out of high school and left her homebound. Now, her mother nursed her back to health as well as she could until Fanny was finally able to kind of get around the kitchen, which is when she learned how to cook. And she eventually turned her parents' house into a boarding house, which was famous for the wonderful meals that Fanny was cooking. But cookbooks then were a lot less instructive, so she kind of hit a wall in her education. And so at the age of 30, able to walk, albeit with a limp, she enrolled in the Boston Cooking School. Now at this time, the school focused on teaching domestic cooks, i.e. cooks who worked in the houses of the middle class and wealthy families of Boston. It was also the beginning of what was known as the domestic science movement. This focused on the science, sometimes pseudoscience, of different ingredients and how those ingredients could make up a proper diet and nutrition. It was also a breakthrough time in the cleanliness standards of a kitchen. It was just a few years after Joseph Lister developed practical applications of germ theory when he had the gall to suggest that it might be a good idea to wash your hands and instruments when going from surgery to surgery. Side note, there is a wonderful book called The Butchering Art, which is all about Joseph Lister and this period in surgical history. It's absolutely fantastic. I'll put a link in the description to where you can read or listen to that. Anyway, his ideas about sanitation in the operating theater ended up moving over to the kitchen right around when Fanny Farmer was coming up with her ideas for her cookbook. Now, as students came and went from the school, Fanny kind of stuck around like that 21-year-old football player who still hangs around high school even though he graduated three years ago. But unlike him, they made her principal. And one of her first orders of business was to update Mrs. Lincoln's Boston cookbook, which had been written by an earlier principal named, not surprisingly, Mrs. Lincoln. And it had been the principal text that was used in the school. Fanny's updated version called the Boston Cooking School Cookbook was published in 1896. But the publisher, Little Brown and Company, didn't think that it would do very well. So they only printed 3,000 in that first run and they made her pay for it. But in return, she got to keep all of the rights and pretty much all of the profit. And to quote Pretty Woman, big mistake, big, huge, because the book ended up selling hundreds of thousands of copies during her lifetime and millions ever since. They had to feel dumber than that manager that dumped the Beatles. Now, many people credit her with coming up with the modern recipe, standard temperatures, cook times, and quantities of ingredients, but she didn't. Ingredient quantities had appeared in recipes for millennia, albeit very inconsistently, but they'd been rather common in the recent decades. Now, cook times, those were pretty new, but again, she wasn't the first. And set oven temperatures? Well, that wouldn't happen for another 20 years. No, her biggest contribution was the level measure. Good judgment with experience has taught some to measure by sight, but the majority need definite guides. And that is true, especially for people who haven't been cooking that long, a measuring cup is an invaluable tool. But it turns out that not everybody used them the same way. To measure a cupful, put in the ingredients by spoonfuls or from a scoop, round slightly and level with a case knife, care being taken not to shake the cup. 
I mean, that kind of seems like common sense now, but that was revolutionary. It was new information for most people. But with some ingredients, mainly flour, the difference between spooning it into a measuring cup and scooping can mean a huge world of difference because flour will compact. Also, the actual, like, humidity in the air can alter the amount of flour. So the best way to measure it would actually be in grams or, or weight, and that she wasn't doing. But it was a step in the right direction. She also explained different ingredients to people who probably hadn't come across them. Cayenne pepper is the powdered pod of capsicum, grown on the eastern coast of Africa and in Zanzibar. It'd probably be more helpful if she said, oh, by the way, it's super spicy, but she didn't. But it's a start, you know, I mean, in, in the days before Google, this was, this was, this was big. So while she didn't actually develop the modern recipe, she did help to kind of standardize it and make it available to the masses. The school was geared toward those who could afford professional help, professional cooks at their house, but not everyone could afford that. The book, pretty much everyone could afford. It actually became so popular as a wedding gift that it was known as the Bride's Bible. Kind of a different time. It was also a different time when the Boston Globe described Miss Farmer as the New England spinster schoolmarm who taught millions of women the way to a man's heart. Sure. In the same article, which is from 1947, by the way, they talk about subsequent editions being updated to keep up with the times. Because corned beef has gone ritzy these days, one would now look in vain for the statement she once printed, corned beef furnishes bulk to the poor man's diet. The book became so popular with housewives that in 1902, she left the Boston Cooking School and founded Miss Farmer's School of Cookery, which focused more on teaching housewives rather than hired help this was during a time when a lot of people were starting to give up their servants. She also really began focusing more on diet and nutrition, writing a new cookbook, Food and Cookery for the Sick and Convalescent. And she even became a guest lecturer at Harvard Medical School, where she lectured up until 10 days before she died in 1915. So even though she may be credited with a bit more invention than she's actually responsible for, and those who really enjoy freedom in the kitchen might find some of her recipes rather tedious. I do not. I appreciate a well-written recipe, so thank you, Ms. Farmer, for all you did for 20th century cooking. Though I may be speaking too soon, seeing as we haven't actually tried this angel cake. Now, she mentions that if your cake is browning too much that you can put some buttered paper on top. It's probably not necessary with a modern oven, but if you are browning too soon, go ahead and add it. Now at about 40 minutes, you wanna start checking the cake by inserting a wooden skewer or toothpick and pulling it out. And if it's dry, that means the cake is done. Now with angel food cake, it is imperative that it cools completely, about three hours. So take it out and then turn it upside down. Many tins will have these little feet on them for this reason, but if yours doesn't, then just set it on a wire rack. After three hours, if it doesn't release from the tin on its own, just take a sharp knife and run it around the edge and it should release. And here we are, Ms. Fanny Farmer's Angel Cake from 1896. It's gorgeous, let me just tell you. I mean, it looks so fluffy. I think she did a good job, but let's taste it. The thing with angel food cake is it's so spongy, it's almost hard to kind of cut through. Um, but here we go. So I'm gonna just try it plain at first. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. I mean, it's perfect. You get the vanilla. The flavor of angel food cake is very light, unassuming. I love that kind of toothy, chewy quality to it. It's like it takes a second to get into it and then you do and it just kind of, it's so soft. It, it's really wonderful. I'm actually gonna try it with some of the raspberry puree that I made in the last episode on Escoffier and Peach Melba, cause I made a lot. Na, da, 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 da. Yeah, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. Mm -hmm. I was right. So thank you to Trade for sponsoring this video. Just click on the link in the description to get your first bag for free and make sure to follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. You really don't even need a fork, huh? Maybe I should, but mm, it's wonderful.